I just go back to what he said before the season started, the expectations he had, and I just wonder how they're going to justify the status quo. Inside Scoop is powered by MLB Perfect Inning. Here is FT Senior Insider Ken Rosenthal with us right now. Ken, I actually wanted to jump right to the managers on the hot seat first, if we can, because I know you covered 10 managers, and in yesterday's Fair Territory, you hit a few of the, I would say, bigger names in Aaron Boone and Dave Roberts that are going to be in the playoffs, see how they perform, plus Skip Schumacher. Are there any others, I'll start with you, in between there that you'd like to point out that you think could be really interesting, maybe kind of unpredictable coming up this offseason that you wrote about? Obviously, if I could predict it, then I'd have a better idea what was going on. I don't know that we can predict it, but I do know this. Every offseason, once the regular season ends, we have surprises, it seems to me. And last year, of course, was one of the bigger surprises in recent memory. That was the Craig Council hiring by the Cubs and the firing of David Ross. I don't know that anything like that is going to happen this year. One particular team I found interesting and find interesting is the Pittsburgh Pirates. This is a team where if you go back before the season to the article Stephen J. Nesbitt and I wrote about the Pirates, we quoted Bob Nutting in there as saying he expected the team to take a meaningful step forward and that he was pointing toward postseason contention this year. They're not there. They're going to finish with about the same number of wins as they did last year, and that's with Paul Skeens and even Jared Jones and a better team overall than they had last year. And yet... Ben Sherrington, the president of baseball operations, has been very adamant and vocal about Derek Shelton coming back for 2025. And really, it doesn't seem that Shelton or Sherrington is in jeopardy right now. But if Nutting chooses to act, then I would think he would wipe out everyone. And that would start with Sherrington, and then they'd need a new president of baseball operations and a manager. Nutting is not the most proactive guy in the world. We have seen that. But I just go back to what he said before the season started, the expectations he had. And I just wonder how they're going to justify the status quo. And listen, Ben Sherrington has done some really good things. Derek Shelton is a capable manager in a difficult spot. But they have not performed. And that's when these questions arise, when a team has not performed. True. That's true. Do you know their do you know contract status of each of them? Ken, do you know Sherrington and or Shelton's contract status? Uh, AJ got me not off the top of my head. I believe Shelton has one more year, but I'm not. I'm not. I don't even want to speculate. I don't remember off the top of my head. Okay, because Bob Nutting's not going to fire anybody with time left on their contract. Well, that's a great point. Him. Yes. So yeah. I mean, he won't even. He won't even go two hundred grand for Rowdy Telez to get four more at bats or plate appearances. So you think he's going to whatever Shelton and Charrington's contract? Is, you think he's going to pay that? No chance. Do they have any incentives well, in them? Point. Those contracts. Yeah, if they have any incentives, though, they might be. They might be let go right before they hit them. <laughs> yeah. Like if. If, if Shelton goes like 160 more games, 159, he might get left. But that, that's a different story. All right, Ken, I want to – the Pirates, yes, they're definitely one. But here's what I want to ask you about, the, the Cardinals. I'm sure you saw Katie Wu's article in The Athletic today. Is Ollie Marmel in any trouble? Because I saw Hein Bloom has taken a bigger part in the organization. Mosellock, I think, is signed for one more year. And Ollie Marmel, I think, his contract matches him. So no, is there any – No, Marmel's 26. Derek Shelton's contract, Just I looked it up just now, is – the length has not been announced, so we don't know exactly where they are with that. Now, you want to talk about the Cardinals, good topic. Katie wrote an amazing story today about where they are and the failures of their player development system. And Scott, I know you talk a lot about how on this show we talk about things that no one else talks about in the sport. Well, at The Athletic, we do things and write stories that no one else writes either, and this is one of them. It's one of our better ones. What Katie describes is an expanded role coming for Heim Bloom, who was, of course, added as an advisor last offseason. He's not going to take over as president of baseball operations just yet, according to everything that we've heard. Mozeliak will take one more year. He has one more year to go and then step aside. He has publicly said that that is going to be the case. Marmel is signed through 26. What the article focuses on is the changes that are going to come to their player development operation. They are short-staffed in player development, which is staggering to think about that this is the St. Louis Cardinals, a team that has prided itself on player development going back to George Kissel and then even when Jeff Luno rebuilt their system through analytics, incorporating analytics into their draft process, all of that. And yet 
here is where the Cardinals are now. They've made some choices to spend more on Major League payroll than on the infrastructure for the farm system, and it has cost them. It has cost them dearly, and I advise everyone, even if you're not a Cardinals fan, you will find this article interesting because it discusses the way this team has kind of fallen, and it has shown on the field from a Major League perspective in the last two years. Let's not forget all the Red Sox who have one of the better farm systems, all their prospects, who were they drafted or signed by? Heim Bloom. So he, yes. that's the thing about when Heim Bloom was let go and they brought in Breslow, he did everything they wanted him to do. They, now, they didn't win at the big league level, but their whole point was we got we had Dombrowski, let's throw him to the Phillies where he's done terrible, right? <laughs> like, oh, no. But they brought in Heim Bloom because they wanted him to develop a farm system and develop people that could continuously fill it. Look at their roster. Cassis. And all these guys, Anthony, and all these guys that are coming. Dude, they've got four big prospects. Marcelo Meyer, right? Yes. These are all Christian Heim Bloom Campbell guys, was... so he did exactly what they wanted. Yes. But whatever, that's that's either here or there. AJ, you make a great point. I don't know that we need to relitigate the Heim Bloom dismissal, but you're absolutely right. He did essentially follow their orders. And the mixed messages at the last two deadlines that he had or that he operated with, remember, they kind of were in a weird place and – they weren't really buying. They weren't really selling. That, too, I would attribute to ownership sending him mixed messages. But anyway, that's in the past. Looks like at some level he's going to get another chance. Katie Wu writes today that he is going to essentially be the guy in charge of restructuring their player development system, and we'll see where that goes. I want to talk a little bit about teams now, um, other than uh, the Cardinals or whatever it is, the Mets and the Braves. This is crazy what's going on here. This is why I talked yesterday about this is why I love baseball. I love when it comes down the wire. You can always look back at the season and be like, man, there's probably like five to ten games where it's like we probably should have won and you wouldn't be in this scenario. And that's that's life too as well. Um, how do you see how do you see this uh, playing out here in, in these <laughs> next three days or four days? What what do you what do you think in, in Tom, your it's mind? a great question. And don't forget the diamondbacks, they're right in the middle of this thing <laughs> yeah. as well. I don't know how it's going to play out. In fact, what's really interesting to me about the way these teams are proceeding, the Mets and Braves anyway, they're kind of taking it one day at a time as far as who they are pitching. And it appears the Braves will not pitch Sale, start Chris Sale, until they are on the verge of elimination. They're going with Max Free tonight. The Mets are going with Sean Manaya against the Brewers. The Braves are facing the Royals. And this would have been Sale's turn. If you pitched him today, you would have had a chance to pitch him again in the wild card series. Who knows if that will happen now if they get there. So it's going to be a really interesting few days. And I know we've all spent a lot of time in the last few days talking about the implications of the rain out, who's to blame and all of that. This will be decided on the field one way or the other. And I made this point on my podcast yesterday, Fair Territory, and some fans took objection to it. But if you don't like being in this situation, you should have won more games in the start. And it's what you're saying, Todd. I don't mean to be cruel about it or, I don't know, insensitive, but my gosh, if you had won five more games down the line, you wouldn't be sitting here worrying about this particular situation that you're in and you wouldn't have been in it in the first place. So we can always look back like that, of course, but this is where we are now and it's going to be a very interesting weekend to say the least. I love Ken doing like the high school coach of, hey, you don't like it? Play better. Play better. Play better. I like, like that. To play better. That's hey, the old baseball right. saying forever. That's the whole thing. You can complain all you want, but you wouldn't have to be in this situation. And the crazy thing is, Ken, because um, I know you are into this stuff, and Jason Stark is the most probably over at the Athletic. We could have the scenario where the Mets don't care about Monday. So Mike Puma, who's been a longtime writer in New York, said they should sign Bartolo Colon to chuck 18 innings on Monday. <laughs> I mean, think about it though. Like for for how the the game. Um, whatever you want to call it, ethics are, the Mets, it's not their problem that the schedule got all screwed up. And if they end up being in, but the Braves need to win, if I'm the Mets, I'm like, I'm preparing for the wild card. I don't care about these games. Mm -hmm. I'll, win, I'll lose 20 nothing both games. That's not my problem. And that's where the impact is felt by the Diamondbacks, potentially, if they are in the mix with the Braves under that scenario, right? Because if the Braves are not in position where the Mets are trying and they have an advantage there, then that would hurt seemingly the Diamondbacks' chances if the Diamondbacks are still in it, which you would think would be the case. I also wrote today about how this can have an effect on San Diego and Milwaukee if, and the word if is important here, 
if the commissioner decides that the games on Monday are only for seeding and they should not be played. If that's the case, you've got the Mets and Braves playing two fewer games than the Padres and Brewers. Their pitchers are not extended the same way, and they have a little bit of a beef at that point, I would say. The Padres and Brewers do because they've earned the home field advantage in the wild card round. And here they are. These two teams don't have to extend themselves the way they otherwise should have. Now, obviously, if, the, that was, if those games are played, right, if they are played, yeah, the Mets and Braves will be at a severe disadvantage in the wild card round. But there could be a scenario if Manfred pulls the plug on Monday where, I don't know, I would say the Braves and Padres would have a beef. Yeah, I'm rooting for chaos. Yeah. And this is a different kind of chaos, but I'm rooting for <laughs> chaos. Okay, on, on that topic, we got a fan question about this, and, and it's a good point. I want to make sure I bring up this team, um, the Minnesota Twins. What just happened? And the fan question was about Rocco Baldelli slash who is to blame with this epic, epic collapse from a team that thought they were good going back to last offseason. It is epic. Their playoff odds early September were something like 95%. It took a collapse for this to happen, for them to be on the verge of elimination. You see the standings right there. Dan Hayes from The Athletic has written about how this really goes back to last offseason when they didn't do much, the deadline when they didn't do much, and they were left in a position where down the stretch they had three rookie starters out of five due to partly the injury to Joe Ryan and a bunch of other young guys on the field where – they really needed more than that. They had Correa and Buxton finally come back at the end, but it was almost too little too late. So they have to take a hard look at the way they've gone about it, in my opinion. I don't know that you can pin this on Rocco Baldelli. I don't know that you should pin this on Rocco Baldelli. At the same time, in that manager's column you referenced, Scott, I wrote about how Rocco is kind of a laid-back manager, and maybe he needs to become more assertive in the future because this team just did not fire when it needed to fire. What he seemed to indicate was a lack of urgency among some of their youngsters. Now you can point to the manager with that, but you can also point to the players too. So it's an organizational wide breakdown as it always is when these things happen. And it's extremely disappointing if you're Minnesota. You're in a division where there's no runaway team. The Tigers have played great. The Royals have had a tremendous year. The Guardians, I'm sorry have played great as well. But it's not like you're dealing with the Yankees at the top or the Astros at the top. And here they are in that division, and they were unable to get it done. And that's kind of inexcusable. Yeah, you're right. But let me ask you this, Ken. Who are your dorks of the week this week? Because I'm disappointed in you. I already know the answer. But who, who did you pick? I picked the Pittsburgh Pirates for their treatment of Rowdy Telez. Okay, that's smart. But you know who you should you have a problem with that? I do. Well, no, you should have had two, though. You should have had yourself. Because a couple of weeks oh. ago, you said, Tigers are cooked. Oh, they're done. They're the worst team in the history of baseball. <laughs> oh, oh, you know, the Illich is there. They're not trying. And boom, here they are. They made the playoffs. So it should be you. So welcome to the two time. Well, first of all, AJ, first of all, AJ, if you're paying any attention at all, in print and on my podcast, I have referenced that. I have done my mea culpas. I can't do them every week. Once is enough, if you ask me. Actually, I've done it multiple times. I apologize to the Mariners, too, who later fizzled. Yeah, I was wrong about the Tigers. A lot of people were wrong about the Tigers. I don't think I described them in quite the way you said it, but I did not expect that they would be on the verge of making the playoffs. I don't know that too many people did. And yeah, I said it. So for that, I own it. And I was dork of the week, I believe, last week for that. But only John Fisher gets multiple honors oh yeah me. <laughs> and me and yeah. me i've got two so. dork of the week and is you do have two aj john fisher what's that <laughs> sponsored by john fisher yes. i mean all right so, he didn't pay for the sponsorship don't worry <laughs> <laughs> now, now cam before we let you go i know you're in milwaukee and i know you're staying at the fister so have you seen any ghosts and if you do and when you do see ghosts are you going to talk to them or are you going to hide in your bed with your covers over your head and put your blankie up first off i am not at the fister it's been a oh, long time God. since i stayed at the fister <laughs> I never had a problem with the Fister Hotel. I never ducked from the ghosts or anything like that. And in fact, I enjoyed the Fister. If I recall correctly, and it's been at least 20 years. Great burgers, man. True. Oh, yeah. yeah. Food. Yeah. Food hey, good. great, Food great breakfast, too. Good pancake. Yeah. Food good. Rooms creepy. And the bar at the top, I think it's called the Blue Bar on top, is really mm -hmm. very cool, too. But it's creepy rooms. It's yeah. creepy. Depending rooms. on what side you're on. <laughs> 
Right, right. But yeah. yeah, I I remember my last day there and I was like, I'm not doing this anymore. And I asked, I was like, I'll stay 10, 15 minutes further. It's just not for me. I know where Ken's staying and it's nice. <laughs> you can't say it. It's can't nice. Say it. I'm not going to say it. Yes. I said he was staying at the Fister. Exactly. But I know where he's staying, but it's a nice hotel. Well, Ken, enjoy the game. Have a great uh, broadcast with the Mets and the Brewers on Fox this weekend. And we'll talk to you next week. Thanks, guys. Thank you. FT Senior Insider Ken Rosenthal with us for the Inside Scoop, which is powered by MLB Perfect Inning. You can scan the QR code and download MLB Perfect Inning 24. You can get the best baseball game in the palm of your hands. You can download it for free on your phone. All the latest from the 2024 season. It's awesome. So check it out. Hey, everybody. Be sure to like and subscribe for more content. We're back here every weekday, all year long, so do not miss an episode. The videos are coming in all day. Here's another video you might enjoy baseball the way it should be covered.